Saul, Israel's first king, lost the opportunity of greatness because of envy, jealousy, and hatred. It all came to a head in the scripture that I want to read from the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel. David and Saul are returning in triumphal parade through the cities of Israel, and the people cry out, praising David and not Saul. Listen to the word of God. So David went out wherever Saul sent him, and he prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing to all of the people, and pleasing also to the servants of Saul. And it happened as they were coming, when David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out from all of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to greet Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. And they said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Then Saul became very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David tens of thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day forward. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. And he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual, and a spear was in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear at David. And he said, I will pin him to the wall. But David escaped twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him and not with Saul. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, you have given us magnificent opportunities, advantages, wonderful chances. Help us to know that we are special to you and that you have a plan and a purpose for us which no other person can accomplish. So grip us with the realization of our uniqueness that we will enjoy being the person we are and enable other people to be the unique person you've called them to be. So, Lord, teach us from this scripture the destructive power of envy and jealousy and set us free to praise you and encourage others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. There were two men standing on a street corner, and they were having a conversation about other people. They made the fatal mistake of comparing themselves with others. A hopeless drunk staggered by, and one said, there but for the grace of God go I. A few moments later, a mutual friend drove by on his way to work. His face was radiant. He was a joyous, winsome Christian. And the other said, rejoining the first remark, and there but for me go I. Comparisons, they just don't work. In this case, a man compared himself with a hopeless failure and felt secure. That doesn't mean that he's living up to his potential. And the other praised another person and complained about the fact that he was not able to be what that person was without realizing all that he could be. 
The result of comparisons is that we have within our inner being what Hawthorne called the serpent of the soul, jealousy, envy, hostility. The whole problem is that we lose the uniqueness, that specialness that each of us has. God created each of us for a particular place to do a particular work that no other human being can do. And he equips us for that, showering on us the blessings, the resources, the powers that we need to do that. Saul's basic problem was with Saul. Only he called his problem David. On that very auspicious day, when they rode in triumphal array in a patriot's parade, it all came to a head. And Saul realized that he was gripped in a pathetic spasm of jealousy with young David. Well, get inside of his heart. Empathize. Feel what he must have felt riding along there with David with the people cheering for David and not for him. Hear what they said through his ears. See the people's faces through his eyes. Don't be too cruel on Saul until you've done that, but imagine it, swaying there on your steed, watching David very carefully. David has slain Goliath. He's routed the Philistines. The people are now for David and not for Saul. And they cry out antiphonally from one side of the road to the other, a chant. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. What would that do to your inner heart? Rouse some jealousy and antagonism, wouldn't it? Well, of course it would. But what happened to Saul that brought him to the place that a spasm of jealousy and envy became a permanent condition, an obsession, until finally it became the very passion of his being to destroy David? Let's look back at this man and find out how it happened. Because in each of us, there is the potential of losing the exciting person we were meant to be by comparing what we have or do not have on the basis of what other people have. No person was given greater advantages, opportunities, resources, affirmation of people, and power of God than Saul. Saul was tall. The scriptures tell us that he was a handsome man, and that he stood head and shoulders over all of Israel. From the waist up and the shoulders and his head, he could be seen in any crowd because he was feet taller than others. He was born of the family of Kish. The scripture says that his father was a man of valor. The translation of the Hebrew means that he had wealth and influence, a man of great power. And he was willing to entrust it to his son. So he had all of the natural resources available to him. He was a man of natural intellect, emotional strength, natural courage, amazing ability. What went wrong? We wonder. The Lord gave him an experience of himself through Samuel. He came to him, gave him a new heart. As he walked along the road and met the prophets, he was given a deep emotional experience of the power and love of God, and he spoke with ecstatic speech. He became a channel of God's power. The people elected him to be the first king of Israel. He knew their affirmation and encouragement. God touched the hearts of a band of people to be his supporters. 
he gave him an evidence that he was with him in his first battle and he was able to defeat the Philistines. What happened? The story of Saul is one of the most pathetic stories in the Old Testament. Because here was a tall man with a little heart, a broad shoulder and a narrow heart. Here was a man who towered over others, but was not able to control his own soul. How did tall Saul fall? We wonder. <laughs> it happens step by step, and the scriptures very carefully calculate the progress. First of all, the first time that we see Saul, he's in search of his father's donkeys, and he can't find them, and his servant says, let's go see Samuel the seer. And Saul says, who's that? Strange. While Israel was gripped with soul-sized issues, Saul did not know Samuel, the prophet. He was so bounded north, south, east, and west by Saul that he wasn't aware of what was going on in Israel. He plowed his father's fields. That was all that was necessary. And he didn't realize the deep, deep needs that should engulf him and his people. And so... We see a man who is insensitive to what's going on in his own contemporary scene. But secondly, we see a man who's totally unaware of what God has done to him. Samuel anoints him, tells him that he's going to be king, and when the people elect him as king, they can't find him. He's hiding in the baggage. He knows that he is appointed for leadership and he's afraid. Why? We wonder. Great intellect, physical stature, but a frightened, furtive heart. It was because of the baggage of his own personality, not the baggage in which he was hiding. And when the Lord found him, told the people where he was, they brought him out and hailed him as king. And the Lord gave him an assurance of his power when he went against the enemy. He was able to defeat them as one man, along with his others. And he discovered that the Lord would give him unlimited power, but he didn't trust him. It's amazing. We see in Saul the impatience, the lack of surrender, the lack of commitment and loyalty that so often leaps up in all of us. Samuel told him, don't make a sacrifice without me. But he got tired of waiting. He wanted to go into battle. He knew he couldn't do that without a sacrifice to God. So he said, Samuel isn't here. I'll do it. And so he moved out of the position of being king and assumed the position of being priest and prophet in Israel and made a sacrifice and defied the leadership of Samuel in the theocracy, which was Israel. And then when Samuel told him, go into battle, but don't take any booty, he disobeyed. And he took Agag the king, took a chain around his neck, and dragged him around Israel to display him as his accomplishment. Something was wrong inside of Saul. He couldn't do what he was told by God through Samuel. And Samuel came striding into his camp and he said, Saul, what are you doing? To obey is more important than sacrifice. And disobedience is divination. Hmm, that's the secret. He couldn't settle down and live within the rhythms of God's power, doing what God wanted him to do when he wanted him to do it. He built altars to himself. When his son Jonathan won a battle, he sent the word out throughout Israel Saul has won the battle. He couldn't give his son the credit. Tragic. How could that happen? It was because of the fracture in Saul's life between him and the Lord 
that eventually he became pathologically jealous of David? It was because he didn't know who he was that he outraged himself with his vaudeville talent. It was because he didn't really want God that he couldn't rule for God in Israel. And when David came along and the threat was made by Goliath, that nine foot eight inch giant of the sons of Agag, it wasn't Saul, not tall Saul, the tallest man in Israel who stepped forth, but a young boy by the name of David. And he took his sling and he defeated the Philistine and cut off his head and routed the Philistines. But the amazing thing was that Saul said, who is that boy? Read back in the scripture and you find out that David had been his armor bearer. There you see the man. He had never even looked at that boy's face as he was growing up in his court. He didn't realize that David was so devoted to him that he would give his life to him. And yet when David was given the claim in Israel, he couldn't take it. David has slain his tens of thousands. The people saw in Saul that terrible spirit of jealousy and envy and hostility, and it ruined the king. What does this all say to us in the everyday kind of life that we live? It means simply this, that envy and jealousy and eventually hatred is the telltale sign that something's wrong in our relationship with God. There's some place where we refuse to surrender to him, to obey what he wants us to do, to be loyal to his cause, to follow him and no one else. It also means that there comes a time in our lives when we need to determine that we are unique, the special person of God, that there's no one else given the opportunities and the attributes that we have. There's a special place for us, and we are to live without reservation in that place. Saul couldn't do that. He took his readings from David rather than from the Lord. He was unable to be fully the man that he was supposed to be. But also note that he failed to be able to cheer the people who gave their lives to him. One of my predecessors here at the Hollywood Church, remarking about Henrietta Muir, said, that lady has made three pastors great. Now, she was the director of Christian education, and he claimed that it was because of the procession of people who came through this sanctuary because of that lady that he was able to be great. I like people who are able to call around them strong people and give them credit and give God the glory. I talked to a man the other day whose son has taken over his business. He's a British chap. And he said, oh, Lloyd, I want to tell you, my son has multiplied the business. He's done so much more than I could have ever done. I like that. Because he can give credit where credit is due. I believe God calls us to be the head of the cheering section for our husband or wife, our friends, our associates. I talked to an executive the other day, and he said, I could not do what I do if it were not for my assistant. I want you to know that he's the secret of my success. I like that. You see, when God is the source of our security and we're comfortable with that special person he's created us to be and know that he's given us all that we need to be faithful and obedient to him, then we can point to him and lift other people up. Are you a burden or a boost? Do people leave your presence saying, what an exciting opportunity God has given me? Now, there are five ways that you can confront and win in the battle over jealousy and envy. One, accept the fact that you're a called, chosen, appointed, cherished person of God. Secondly, accept the fact that you have been given a task given to no one else 
a place that is your place. Thirdly, accept the fact that God will give you everything you need to accomplish that, and you don't need to compare yourself with anyone else. Fourthly, become the cheering section for the people around you, the one person on whom they can depend to give them a boost. And lastly, give God the glory and other people the credit.